Hello, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm here with Cisco Meraki, and welcome to the third out of five uh, Cisco Meraki Bright Talk webinars. So glad to have you here today. Uh, I'm your MC, Jordan. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to our resident expert, John Kukta, here in a moment. Uh, but first, I would like to just point out a few things about the platform and some basic housekeeping things. Uh, this session will be recorded and it will be hosted on the Bright Talk platform. So if you have to hop out in the middle of it, you can always return to the platform and finish it later. Uh, the system does have the ability to ask questions. There's a Q&A tab on the right side of the interface. So as we go through the session, if you have any burning technical questions or just general questions, uh, feel free to add those to the Q&A panel and I'll help to prioritize and answer what we can in the moment. Anything we can't answer, we'll save to the end and or follow up with you uh, after the webinar. Uh, and finally, just realize that we are uh, on this platform, uh, we are presenting live, although there is a one to two minute delay. Uh, as a result. So again, if you have questions, get them in early so we don't uh, overlook them. Uh, and certainly we'll reserve some time at the end of the call. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to John, who's going to walk us through uh, Dashboard API. John, take it away. Hey, thank you, Jordan, so much. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Uh, I'm hoping that today we can really give you an idea uh, about how similar uh, APIs are to concepts you're already familiar with. And the CLI is a great place to start. So uh, with that said, let's take a look at the agenda. First, we're going to uh, have a little introduction about myself so you know who I am. Uh, then we're going to get into the uh, introduction to the dashboard API, talk about some use cases. And then we'll get to some uh, follow-up resources and Q&A section. So um, about me, uh, well, my name is John Kukta, uh, product architect for Meraki Cloud Platform and API. Uh, I have been building network infrastructure since 1999. Uh, that is not a joke. Um, I, have, I, I think back then, Wi-Fi was 802.11b. That was about as good as it got. 10 base T Ethernet hubs were still popular. And games like StarCraft had IPX SPX options, just in case your network wasn't TCP IP. Um, my first jobs in networking were some of the hardest, uh, pulling Cat5 through a uh, hot crawl space in August, for example, um, and driving hours out to remote sites to troubleshoot simple issues. I'm sure we've all been there. Um, you get there, you find out that you've got the wrong version of the console cable or a wrong power injector. Yeah, not fun. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we've come a long way since then. Um, and over the past decade, I've spent some time at other networking vendors, more recently with the Cisco Gold Partner and multi-vendor VAR in Southern California, where I managed about $50, about $50 million in major infrastructure upgrades covering everything from Wi-Fi to SD-WAN and VXLAN. Uh, overall goal, of course, is to deliver uh, uh, lower TCO for infrastructure and realizing ROI from those investments. So in other words, getting the job done as quickly and easy as possible and leveraging them to their fullest extent. So at Meraki, I look after our API first strategy and our API development roadmaps across the different products in the Meraki portfolio. And I have to say that this is definitely the most fun job I've had yet. Uh, so let's take a walk down memory lane. Do you remember uh, how uh, you much time you spent finding the best terminal emulator or mastering Cisco commands? For example, you got your first CCNA, your first credential in, in networking and memorizing all of those commands. Um, do you remember ever you know, copying in, uh, a plain text config and then pasting it onto a new device? Um, well, if you're in this session, I'm sure you have probably configured a piece of network equipment using the CLI. Um, and I'd like you to consider how you might describe the process of configuring something via the CLI. And that said, it's also worth uh, asking um, if you've ever worked with APIs. If not, great. We're going to give you a little rundown of how they are different and better than CLI. Now let's talk about how efforts are shifting to code. So first of all, what is an API? Um, some of you may know. Um, if not, I will equip you with the uh, textbook. The textbook definition is application programming interface, which is what it is. Um, but I'd like to kind of give you an idea of what it really means. So uh, first of all, infrastructure management today is increasingly done via automation and software. 
you might have noticed because you've probably worked on projects where some of these things were being implemented and you may have had good or bad experiences with that transition. Um, the software itself can take many forms though. It can be a Python script, it could be a PowerShell script, it could be a single purpose web application, uh, or even a fully fledged piece of commercial software, right? It could be something that is, you know, off the shelf from a, one of our ecosystem vendors, for example. Um, or it could be an open source project that you've worked with um, uh, from GitHub. Um, but if you were, for example, in a different world, right, you were in maybe car manufacturing, um, and a customer came to you and said, we want to build a computer that drives your cars, um, that's kind of an interesting question for you as a manufacturer. Would you suggest that that customer builds a humanoid android, uh, a robot with hands and feet to handle the controls? Um, seems like a big task, right? It might be simpler and probably more reliable if you could offer them an interface, a control interface that was designed explicitly for machine input. Um, and that's where APIs come in. So for a piece of software to interface with other software, it needs an interface that's designed for app to app or machine to machine connections. When you build software that manages your infrastructure, you can operate more efficiently, whether you're deploying equipment, reconfiguring, or even simply monitoring that everything's fine. Now let's look at CLI versus API and some of the advantages. Well, uh, you're probably pretty familiar with CLI. That said, there are a lot of different CLIs out there. Um, you may have experience with Cisco and not Juniper. You may have experience with Aruba and not Cisco, et cetera. Um, and uh, with APIs, you might be a novice, right? So fair, maybe the CLI is a little bit more familiar. Um, now reusability on the other hand for CLIs, um, not very high, right? There's only so far you can get with a plain text config from a Cisco Catalyst switch, for example, and try to apply it to a Meraki device, right? It doesn't work. Um, or a newer Juniper device, right? Aruba device, going to have some issues. Um, and yes, CLI and API, they're both interfaces, um, but ultimately the API is likely to be much more reusable. Um, APIs can be device agnostic, right? They can abstract the lower level firmware commands from the ones you use to get the work done. So for example, with Meraki dashboard API, we provide an API endpoint for switch port configuration and another one for network events. And they apply to all of our switch models across the stack, regardless of the firmware version or the model number, right? This is a big advantage when you're working at scale across environments that might vary quite a bit. And as far as cloud to cloud or machine to machine connections, uh, that is not a great experience for CLI. In fact, the API here is a pretty clear winner. The abstraction that they offer enables faster, simpler, and more reliable integrations between your product stacks, such as between your network infrastructure and your SIEMs or your other cloud infrastructure, because the APIs are specifically built for that purpose, um, not expecting that a, a human is in between to manipulate the data to make it work. So let's take a look at the next slide. We'll talk about the value of APIs. Why do customers use APIs? Well, this is a pretty common question, right? And there's really three key pillars of API uh, benefits, right? And they are um, uh, automation for one, right? We've already covered that executing configuration changes or deployments uh, at scale via software. Uh, and I've mentioned direct integrations with the other business systems, your SIEMs, for example. Um, but another key use case is to anticipate your future needs, right? So where you, where you are today, yes, understand that. But then where will you need to go when you need to upgrade your infrastructure? And when will you need to do that? When might you need to dispatch a technician to resolve an issue as opposed to solving it remotely? Um, and for example, when does the Radius Server Certificate use, uh, uh, use for your wireless network need renewing, right? APIs can answer all of these use cases depending on the vendor that you work with. And just like, uh, just like the um, CLI and Syslog and SNMP APIs, we offer different APIs for the job that you're trying to do. Um, if we imagine, for example, tracking interface state changes for a device like a switch, um, then there might be a different tool for the job 
right? So if we imagine having the CLI available to us and the syslog and SNMP and NetFlow, and our goal is to track the interface state changes, then a question for you is which should we use, right? Well, we um, could use CLI, right? I mean, we could go in and check, you know, dump the config, did anything diff from last time? Seems a little manual, probably not that fast uh, to get done. Uh, we could look at NetFlow, for example, you know, your traffic drops off, maybe something went wrong. That could be an indicator that, you know, there's a state change. Um, syslog, for sure, right? You could definitely use syslog uh, as long as that event is being logged. Um, and SNMP, classically speaking, might be the best option, right? Technically, all of these things could get the job done, but some are better targeted for the purpose than others. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Um, of these tools, like we do support uh, a number of these, for example, you know, we already have syslog, we already have SNMP. Um, and so these aren't necessarily obsoleted by APIs. Uh, we do offer them. Here's an example of doing a, a MIB walk, for example, um, and some of the SNMP traps that we support um, using a Python script that one of our engineers uh, built. Um, this is coming from Meraki Equipment. As you can see, we do support this. Um, but let's look at the actual different use cases for those APIs and the different ones that we offer. Um, Rocky's dashboard API is really just one of many. Um, it is the most general purpose and it's one of the most popular APIs for sure. Um, we also offer webhooks, which can be a lot more efficient for event streaming, triggering automations, uh, state changes, for example. Um, we also offer location analytics API, also known as scanning API for purposes like wayfinding and asset tracking, uh, location analytics. If you've heard of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth triangulation of clients, uh, that's our, what our scanning API is doing. Um, we also offer a captive portal API for customizing our uh, captive portal pages on your wireless network. And MVSense API is an MQTT events-driven telemetry API uh, where we provide a time series stream of events via uh, uh, the arrest. So uh, there's lots of different tools here depending on the job. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit into dashboard API next. If you've used the Meraki dashboard, then the left side of this slide might look familiar. right? But generally, when we are uh, pre presenting information in API, tables are really not so easy for computers to use. So computer-to-computer -computer connections, application-to-application, machine-to-machine, a structured data format is going to be much, much easier to use than parsing an HTML table. So as nice as tables are for humans, we actually use a format called JSON for the API structure, and that's shown here on the right. And you can see that this structure is very predictable. It's a little bit more linear. It's easier for uh, applications to interface with, and it's much easier to develop software with. If you've ever tried to parse uh, via an application an HTML table, uh, you probably know that pain. We bypass that with a data format that is specially designed for machines. And next, let's look at Webhook API. Now, webhooks, uh, in general, are also a REST uh, API, but this is a push service. If, uh, if you imagine Dashboard API as a general purpose kind of inbound uh, API where you send us requests and then we respond with data, Webhook is an outbound service where we let you know when something's changed or something's happened. Right? So you can already receive events uh, via many different products, uh, via email, which can get you to a certain extent. You might have even built email automations in the past, uh, even Outlook rules or whatnot. Um, you can imagine that was probably, I mean, if you've done it, you know that that's generally painful um, and pretty limiting. Uh, on the other hand, if you subscribe to Webhooks via our Webhook API, we can send you that same structured data format when these things happen. And you'll notice here that it's also formatted in JSON, just like with the dashboard API. So it's much, much easier for your applications to uh, to grok and to work with. Let's take a look now at our location analytics API, also known as scanning API. Well, as far as a graphic interface goes in the dashboard, if you've ever configured this, um, you've put at least three of your APs in a network and they all have, uh, they all have a contemporary firmware version. Um, then they can 
actually give you triangulation statistics on those devices. And technically speaking, you can get this information right in dashboard. You don't technically need to use the API to get it. But the graphics that you see on the left are very, very difficult for a machine or an application to parse. Um, you probably would need to get into not only the table processing for the uh, for the bar graphs and whatnot, um, you need to get into image processing uh, for the heat map. And that's honestly just a lot of work when what you really just need is the data to make the decisions. And that's where the JSON formatting again comes in with our API. So location analytics API also formatted as a JSON data load. And if we take a look and just a little closer at this, the information in it is pretty straightforward, right? We can see pretty easily what the SSID name is, right? That the client Mac starts with an 18, for example. That's pretty straightforward. So uh, JSON body can be easier to work with, not just because it's easier for a machine to parse, an application to parse. It's also generally easier to read uh, as a human. And next, let's look at Captain Portal. So Captive Portal API is another API that we offer for specifically customizing the Captive Portal pages in your wireless network. And the basic experience that we offer out of the box, super easy to get set up. Um, it does get the job done in some cases, but if you've worked with retail customers or hospitality customers, then you've probably uh, working with a different set of expectations, right? Virtually all retail uh, customers who offer Wi-Fi, uh, all uh, virtually all hotels offering Wi-Fi have some sort of splash page that is customized and branded. And all of those capabilities come from our Captive Portal API. And this is going to be a little bit more in the HTML uh, realm uh, where you are uh, building web pages, right? So it's not the same JSON structure because it's a different use case, right? So again, different tool for the job. And finally, the last API that I'd like to talk about is the one that really powers our people and vehicle detections. It's that real-time stream of data via MQTT. MQTT is just a uh, really just a data format, messaging format. It's a standard that, that is commonly used for IoT devices. And our cameras can, for example, use MVSense to publish a, a, a almost real-time stream. I mean, it's four, it updates four times per second how many devices, uh, sorry, how many uh, uh, people or uh, vehicles are detected in the frame. So on the left side, dashboard web UI might render the detection as a rectangle um, for the car, for example, and then the yellow ones for the people. Um, but the, again, the machine, the application that you're building, that you're working with, uh, is going to do a lot better if it doesn't have to do the image processing and it can get that data in a textual format. And that's where we, that's what we see on the right. So you'll notice that there's a timestamp value, for example. There are counts of the people and the objects detected. Uh, and then there's also a flux reading from the camera sensor in this case. So again, this is, these are coming in four times per second. And you can build applications that leverage this to make decisions about your business. For example, I mean, do you see uh, do you see higher light levels than you might expect? If the office is dark and all the lights are off and suddenly the lux value spikes, maybe that or it's a check-in from the security person uh, down in the lobby, right? Let's talk about some other use cases, actually. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, real-world use cases that we've worked with. Um, where customers are actually leveraging our APIs to achieve real business outcomes. Um, first one is near and dear to my heart because it is our internal Meraki IT team. They're called Digital Workplace and they are fantastic. Um, the challenge was that they needed to automate the provisioning of Meraki teleworker kits for our employees, right? So if you've heard of the Z series devices like the Z3, uh, these were getting shipped out to Meraki employees so that they could have that zero touch configuration corporate network access. Um, now, configuring them in Meraki dashboard is easy enough, but you probably know if you've worked with Meraki that you still need to claim the devices, uh, you still need to coordinate serial numbers, et cetera. Um, and frankly, that's not that hard to do if you only have to do it once or twice, right? You probably wouldn't build an application if you only had to do it once or twice, but we're talking about hundreds of employees, right? So that 
those clicks add up pretty quickly. And that's where there was uh, there was a call for an automated solution to provisions, claim them, provision them, et cetera. Um, and this was a fun project. Uh, first of all, the solution is a web application where the uh, where the employee who's requesting the device can request uh, the, the kit um, and then actually get the, the equipment once they have a serial number added in. Uh, the, the end customer in this case is the, um, is the employee. Uh, they're able to follow a very straightforward web application to uh, basically a form. They just fill out the form and then that once submitted kicks off the application uh, which then executes the necessary API calls to add the device to inventory, create the dashboard network, bind the configuration to one of our network uh, templates, and then uh, provision the user for that device. Um, this was a big, big win. It basically reduced the uh, time to value uh, from you know potentially weeks, depending on the size of the request and the call volume coming in, to uh, moments, really, um, where minimal intervention from the IT team was required and you can imagine that if you're on the it team um uh, very few of us on it teams have ever felt like we were properly staffed uh you might appreciate that the work is delegated out to the employees as much as possible um, without being too much work for them they don't have to log into dashboard to be clear they just fill out a web form for this and then the rest is done automatically pretty cool uh, let's take a uh, look at that actual uh, web app. So uh, on the left side, you can see the request uh, filling it out. And on the right hand side, uh, there was the ability to select, for example, which device model you needed, or did you already have a device? If you already had a device, then we can onboard that potentially. Um, and that was a big success. Uh, on the, uh, the next slide here, uh, you see an example of the dashboard GUI for all of the networks. And on the right-hand side, the dashboard config for the appropriate SSIDs, all of that config was done automatically via the scripts. Now let's take a look at another, uh, let's take a look at another use case. So Meraki sensor support, uh, sensor uh, report subscriptions. So Meraki sensors, our MT line, will give you statistics about temperature, humidity. Uh, they will tell you when doors open or close, or what is the air quality in a room. There are lots of different purposes for the sensors. Um, generally speaking, they produce a lot of data, right? Especially if you have a busy, active environment, right? Maybe uh, you're dealing like we are in Southern California with an atmospheric river. And so all those leaks that were in the roof that you always knew about are finally coming to fruition because it just will not stop raining. Um, yes, that maybe did happen to me in a prior life, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have the means to just go and like look at the stats all day, right? Um, it would be nice if, you could automate some of the notifications uh, for uh, for this um, to uh, to actually get the right information at the right time. And the right information at the right time might vary depending on your team, right? So for example, you might be responsible for the data center, or you might be responsible for an office building, or you might be responsible for something else. If there's a dashboard network, um, and it has all of the sensors in it, because that's the way your I IT, for example, has provisioned it, then uh, yeah, it is possible if you have dashboard access to go in and subscribe to just the alerts for just the sensors that you want. But if you don't have access to the dashboard or maybe you shouldn't have access to the dashboard because you are a facilities person who doesn't do network changes, uh, you might need uh, some sort of interstitial interface uh, where you can just say, hey, these are the things that I'm responsible for, um, You know, let me know. And so this again is uh, powered by a script uh, where there would be a GUI list of all of the sensors and uh, simply a button to subscribe and unsubscribe to the sensors that matter to you, right? And this is a uh, really a, a staff-facing application, uh, much like the last one, uh, where the staff who are responsible for things can subscribe to just the ones that they care about. And similarly, they can unsubscribe for the ones that uh, they do not manage, right? So they're only acting on uh, the things in their purview um, and not uh, wasting hours dealing with other people's noise. So uh, our GDE team 
uh, global virtual engineering team built a demo application using the MT API. Let's take a look at that uh, UI. Uh, in this case, um, you could pick a number of serial numbers and then subscribe your email address to them. You could also potentially, if you were uh, uh, an app developer, work on uh, subscribing to the webhooks instead of emails. Right Now, emails are a little bit easier for people to handle, uh, but webhooks can get sent to like WebEx Teams channels and uh, uh, Slack channels, uh, Microsoft Teams channels, right? Uh, so whatever messaging applications you have, or you can also be sent to PagerDuty, Datadog, right? All these other logging applications, Splunk, um, via webhooks. Uh, and that would be a seamless integration. Hey, John, just want to interject here quickly. We have a question that just popped up um, Great. from uh, Karam. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Are you using Python with API to automate the processes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so Python is a very, very common entry point for network automation. Uh, Python is a great language to use um, for many different purposes, right? It is a very multi-purpose um, tool. It is a scripted language, it's not a compiled language. So uh, you do not have to worry about compiling it. You just need to have the Python interpreter installed. That said, for the purposes of um, for the purposes of web applications, yes, there might be, uh, for example, a Python Flask application running it in the background, right? That's an option. Um, Python doesn't natively have GUI elements. So if you are using Python, then you will want to use some sort of library like uh, Django or Flask in order to wrap them in a web application. Uh, or uh, if you want like a native interface, then those also exist. And you can also use com uh, Python compiling tools to build native applications. Uh, yeah, so all those things are definitely possible. Um, but the range of applications that are used for uh, automation with uh, our APIs is pretty varied, right? I mean, even, um, I don't know how many of us have used Java. You've probably learned at least a little bit of Java if you've done any software development. Um, Java, uh, Node.js, right? JavaScript, all of these languages support interfacing with REST APIs, for example, like our dashboard API. And so all of these can be used to interface. Um, PowerShell is another good example. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are working on, uh, in Windows environments, and so you have this nice native scripting interface in, uh, in Windows called PowerShell, and you can write PowerShell scripts to interface with uh, dashboard API to get things done. And those may or may not turn into you know, customer-facing applications. Uh, they may be one-off scripts that you write depending on your use case. Um, there's, uh, as long as you've got permission to do the thing that you want to do, there's not really any wrong way to uh, build an application that uses APIs, there are simply concerns about efficiency and effectiveness. You know, what is going to work best for you? Um, I, will, I will say that uh, as a personally as a developer uh, and really as a network engineer first and then a developer second, I found Python very easy to use and learn, where I've personally struggled learning things like Ruby in the past. Um, so Python is a little bit of a comfort zone. Um, PowerShell is also a little awkward for me, but I can kind of make my way through it. Uh, so I generally prefer building in Python, but it's certainly not the only option. As an introductory, as an introductory uh, language, it is a pretty safe bet. So does that answer the question? Hopefully, I know there's a little bit of a delay. Well, let's come back to that in case there's any other questions. I hope that answers it. Um, let's take a look at another exciting use case for APIs. And this one actually integrates a, uh, a few different APIs. Um, and it's about a retail loss prevention problem. So if you've ever worked in retail or if you've ever worked with a retail customer, you probably understand that loss prevention is pretty serious business. Um, the exact details can vary from customer to customer. Uh, and the POS systems that power those businesses also varies. Um, but we had a customer who approached us and said that their particular problem was illegitimate refunds. And so this is the way, this unfortunately was an, uh, an employee-driven attack, as it were. Uh, so our customers' employees, uh, some of them were issuing illegitimate refunds. And the way that it works is uh, they make a legitimate sale to a legitimate customer. 
uh, which creates a record of the transaction. And on the left-hand side, you see an Excel document, which has a list of transactions, for example, um, and their amounts, right? So that's a report that's coming out of the POS system uh, or their accounting software, right? Um, and sometime after that, the employee uh, with malicious intent would uh, issue a fraudulent refund. So they would issue a refund to uh, themselves, for example, taking cash out of the till and it, on paper, it looked like, well, they bought something and then they refunded it. So that's a legitimate transaction. In reality, it was just the employee taking the cash out of the till, um, which is uh, not so great, right? So uh, we built them a retail refund fraud detector. Uh, so in this case, uh, the interface was also pretty straightforward. On the right-hand side, you see what the web app looks like. There was really just one button to upload a CSV file. The CSV file shown there in Excel on the left. And again, it was just a log of transactions. I had the timestamps, et cetera. And so how would you solve this, right? Using the Meraki suite of hardware and APIs. I'm sure there's a bunch of ways you could do it. I'll give you an example that we went with uh, for our customer. Let's take a look at the next slide. So here we've got some top-down views of our camera, uh, our fisheye camera. So this is a fisheye camera that's mounted on the ceiling facing down. And uh, you can de-warp this to look at it on a more uh, familiar view. But the fisheye view gives you the full picture. Um, and what this customer had was they had uh, Meraki cameras. Um, and I think that was all they needed. They might have also had switches, but this API uh, integration did not, strictly speaking, require anything but the cameras and MV sense. So what's happening in this refund event analysis? Well, it's taking the, the timestamp of the uh, transaction, and then it's going to the dashboard API to, uh, to build uh, a snapshot of that transaction. And something like the MV Sense API can tell you how many people are in that frame. And so put together, it was not too difficult to match up the transaction time frame for that refund to actual pictures of the store. And the logic here is that if there's only one person at the till, the person working the register, and a refund is issued, then it might require further investigation, right? Normally there will be another customer there next to the register while you're processing the refund. And this was something that we were able to automate using our APIs. Um, and further, you can see here, there's a link to see the footage. Uh, that's also generated via API so that you can see, uh, for example, like what exactly happened if you wanna drill down into that. And this really helps the customer uh, get down to the uh, get down to the root of the issue, uh, identify employees that were uh, stealing from the store, and deal with the problem. Um, now, hopefully, you are not dealing with this type of problem, but this is an example of how our APIs can come together and then deliver real value for you. Um, now, this particular uh, application that we uh, that we've shown here does not have a lot of branding. That's very intentional. Um, but you can definitely build an application that has whatever store branding uh, you like. It's just a matter of uh, your design chops. And maybe you've got some designers on the team that can uh, help with, for example, the front end design. Um, that will be uh, really a matter for you to think about. Um, and beyond that, uh, we have ecosystem partners who build solutions like this for you that are um, turnkey, much easier to use off the shelf than building it yourself. Uh, so please do consider them uh, when you are diving into this, um, diving into this field of APIs. John, um, before we head into resources here, we have a question from Verlaine. Um, and the question is, what makes the Meraki dashboard API unique compared to other vendors? So if you can talk about just Meraki's API positioning compared to other vendors, that'd be great. Absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, I will say this, not all APIs are, cons are uh, created equal. Um, that, is a, that is unfortunate. I wish, that, I wish that all APIs were great. I wish that all APIs were great to work with, easy to learn, easy to use. Um, let me start with one of the first things that you'll notice. Uh, when you're trying to learn an API, you might start by looking for some documentation, right? Doing some Googling, looking for example code, um, looking for the official doc site. Uh, 
I won't name any vendors, um, but if you've done this, feel free to do this on your own. You might notice that some vendors lock all of their documentation behind logins. Um, for what reason, I don't know. Um, all of our documentation is public facing. Uh, so not only do we have open API spec, which we commit to, um, but we also have a public interactive API doc site. And I don't think that any of our other competitors offer the same. You can actually use our interactive doc site to make real API calls. It is its own web application to make real API calls against uh, dashboard API to experiment and to learn. Um, this is something that uh, kind of as a first step, I think differentiates the Meraki API. Um, there's a number of design uh, concerns uh, that we put into um, that we put into uh, creation of API endpoints that I think really makes our APIs easier to use in general. Um, that might get into a little bit more of like a kind of lofty, idealistic, philosophical Johnny Ive type of conversation, and I'm not sure how much you want to go down that path. But uh, suffice to say, uh, we work very, very hard to make sure that our APIs are very very easy to use and easy to understand. And so as one example, uh, when we have an attribute name in the API, we really want that attribute to be named as specifically and explicitly as possible so that you spend more time getting things done and building things and less time figuring out what is this exact value in the API. Um, another big one, feature coverage. Uh, we offer more than 500, almost maybe even six, more than 600 at this point, public API endpoints. These are API endpoints that are all in GA and officially supported by Meraki. Um, these API endpoints uh, in Dashboard API specifically, that's our general purpose. I mean, they cover uh, you know configuration across your MX, MR, MB devices, um, MS, MT, right? Uh, basically the full Meraki portfolio. Um, and I can't speak confidently to the feature coverage of any uh, of our other vendors. Um, another major consideration, I think that differentiates Meraki Dashboard API, um, as far as I know, as far as the cloud networking vendors are concerned, I think we are the only, I think we're the only outfit that actually publishes numbers on how many API requests we actually process in a given month. Um, we average more than 6 billion API requests in a month, um, which we're pleased to see. We're pleased to see it resonate in the market. Um, I'm not so sure that that's, uh, that any of our competitors are anywhere near that. Um, but that said, it might be hard for our competitors to get there because our API budgets are also way more generous than the competition. For a single Meraki organization, which is a concept in Meraki dashboard, if you create a, an organization, it's basically a, a, a data scope. Um, you have networks inside that organization, and that's uh, kind of your unit of management, your top level unit of management. Uh, you can make 864,000 API requests against that organization in a single day. And uh, I think that our closest competitor lets you do I don't remember, uh, I think it's about an eighth of that uh, at most. Um, we, we support 10 requests per second per org. Um, and I don't think any of our competitors are, are really anywhere close to that. To give you an idea, um, we talked about this number at Cisco Live. Um, if you are in, if you just had one day's worth of API calls, right, our call budget, um, and you were to give one API call out to every resident of Las Vegas, uh, and then another, and just one more API call out to every attendee of Cisco Live, you would still have API budget left over that day. Um, you cannot say the same for any of our competitors. Uh, they would probably struggle, based on the numbers that I have for our competitors, they would struggle to cover the population of Fargo. Um, and yeah, that those are real numbers based on like actual documented things. So um, documented call budgets and rate limits from those competitors and ours. So. Uh, you can get more done, whether that's in a certain amount of time or just across the product, uh, more quickly because it's easier, uh, easier to understand, easier to learn, easier to experiment with. Um, and finally, uh, uh, with a better suite of products, I think, than are offered uh, amongst the competition. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. 
What a comprehensive, awesome answer, John. And I will say, just as an outsider looking in, I know that we have that huge API budget, but I know there are customers that are asking for more, right? Um, so, oh yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, we're definitely invested in continuing to grow uh, the capability and scope of of the API. So, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and we're very excited about that. Uh, the it, that to me is is a great uh, is a great ask. Um, interestingly, uh, we find that in in virtually all cases where that request comes up, um, uh, we're we're always looking at how to be more generous, right? Like, there's a lot of things that uh, that are kind of in the pipeline, as it were, um, that I can't specifically speak to. But uh, most of the time, right, we find that the reason why they're hitting any sort of like exhaustion of their call budget is because they're doing something inefficiently. Right, and a good example would be, um, you know, maybe you call an API pretty frequently if you're checking on like the status of the device, right? That's a pretty reasonable thing to do. You want to make sure the stuff is up, right? Um, but a status doesn't change all that quickly, right? Like it doesn't change a million times a second. Uh, a status changes, you know, uh, once every few minutes. So on the one hand, yes, you can make fewer calls to that API if you know the data update interval, and so that's something we try to be transparent with uh, with our customers. Um, and then there's a lot of other things you can do with Meraki APIs uh, at the organization level, especially in regards to monitoring and telemetry. If you are getting information, um, a major area of focus, uh, major area of focus for us is uh, what we call upscoping existing endpoints. You might have an endpoint, for example, that we shipped uh, years ago that enables you to get information from a single device, right? So you give us a device serial number, you do a get, and we give you whatever information. Um, and that's fine, right? That's pretty straightforward. If you really only need the information for that one device and you're done, then that might be the easiest way to get it done. But if you need the information for all the devices that, and you've got a thousand devices or more, right? Then that's potentially a thousand API calls, right? So in that case, uh, that's where upscoping comes in and we have organization-wide API calls that let you get all of the information uh, in that device-wide call in an org scope call, meaning that per device, uh, all of that information is there. And so that's a thousand X more efficient than the per device call. Um, and another example, I think of how we differentiate from the competition in terms of efficiency. So um, yeah, so yeah, please feel free. Um, even some of our biggest customers we find um, don't come close to exhausting their their budgets, especially when they, uh, you know, especially when they consider uh, the latest developments in the API um, and take advantage of those tools that were shipped. Roger that. Um, well, that, that closes us out for questions. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to some resources, John. Yes, thank you so much. Will you take this one? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of different resources that uh, you can take advantage of. So I'm gonna provide some on the, uh, the learning front and then some on more of the experiential front. So uh, again, a lot of these links are gonna be located in the uh, attachments to this session, so look for those links there. Cisco Digital Learning is a great option. Um, the Cisco Developer Network as well, if you're looking to get uh, access to developer resources. As John mentioned, we have interactive API documentation that's on uh, you know, our, our, our documentation site that you'll be able to access there. The Meraki community is kind of more of an insiders group for current Meraki customers. Um, you don't have to be a Meraki customer, I don't think, to join that community, but it, it's kind of a place where uh, the Meraki users come together and share their findings and things of that nature. So do check out those resources. And then if you want something more on the get your hands on gear side of things or talk to uh, a technical expert side of things, uh, we do offer this through our website. So if you want a demo, go ahead and scan the QR code and we can follow up with you and give you more of a tailored uh, presentation as to how Meraki and the Meraki platform might be able to help your organization. Uh, you can get a free trial of pretty much anything that we have in stock. Uh, and this is brand new equipment, so you'll get the unboxing experience. And then, you know, if you do a POC and it works for you, you can just go ahead and, and buy the equipment. It makes it a little bit easier on, on that side of things. And then finally, we have a whole host of on-demand webinars, not only on the Bright Talk site, but on the Meraki.com website as well. So uh, with that being said, I want to thank everybody for your time. John, thank you so much for your expertise and spending your limited time with us here today. And thanks for all of you that have joined uh, wherever you might be. See you for the next talk. Cheers. Thank you, folks. Bye.